Greetings, everyone. Welcome to night two of a live reading of Glow, the autobiography of Rick James. I'm going to wait for everybody to log on in. Don't ask me what's in that cup. But we're going to uh, read part two. I got a great response um, from last week, last the last reading, rather, um, that we did in regards to this book. Um, I see everybody filing in now. Um, it's a pretty quick read, um, I must say. It's been a long week. What's going on, guys? Danielle. T.L., what's going on? How y'all feeling? Clarissa, hey. Natasha, hey, Natasha. How are you? Gail. Night two, Vicky. So I'm going to wait for everybody to file in before we get started. Grab you a nice little cocktail because I ain't ready. It's been a long week. It's been a very trying week. If you live in... Florida, please don't go to the beach. I know they open y'all beaches up, but please practice common fucking sense. Please. As you choose to venture out, and uh, we have some crazy things going on in the world uh, right now. What's going on, Katina? Hey, Savage, what's up? Veronica... Yeah, she did make it Veronica Dara. So I'm going to wait for a few more folks to log in and then I'm going to get started. Um, Nicole is here. So we basically, in our first reading, we uh, talked about, uh, basically found out about Rick's early, 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 early years um, growing up in Buffalo, New York. We found out some wild shit, okay? Between nuns and priests and 14-year-old girls and, you know, mafia. It's just a lot. A lot of drugs and things uh, <laughs> involved. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Now, this is starting a chapter called Hound Dog. We're going to read a few pages um, tonight, probably about 10 or 15. The white-black tension in American life and American music all came down on me around the time we moved to the Perry Projects. Mom had this 45 RPM record that had a red label with a picture of a peacock. She played it all the time and everyone in our household loved it. Me more than anyone. The singer was Big Mama Thornton, whose voice was like Etta James's, big, brash, and sexy. And the song was Hound Dog. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Going on the wind. I don't know the whole word, but that's how I go. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Okay. Crying all the time. I wasn't even sure what that meant. They sounded so good coming out Big Mama's mouth. Then one day we were watching our little black and white TV. And there was this white boy called Elvis Presley. With slipped back hair and a sneer on his face. Singing the same song. I couldn't quite figure out who he wanted to be. He looked a little bit like a juvenile delinquent, but he was also trying to sound black. Stealing. Stealing. How come they don't have Big Mama singing this song on TV, I asked my mother. Because Elvis is the most popular thing since sliced white bread. What's so good about him? The girls like him. He's pretty, and he don't mind shaking his booty. Won't he get in trouble for stealing this song from Big Mama? Anyone can sing anything they like. Well, I can sing as good as that guy, I said. Mom laughed. I bet you can. I bet you will. I want you to. And then they put me on TV instead of him. By the time you grow up, maybe they will. When I started public junior high, I saw a lot of guys who looked like Elvis. They had the slick back hair and the sneer on their lips. They were the guys who were quick to call me nigger. They were the guys who made me realize that Although mom wanted to give us the advantages of living in the white world, the white world didn't want us. My main running partner was my brother Roy. He and I were the only blacks in school. The white gangs chased us home every day. 
If we weren't so fast, they would have made it. Every day it felt like we were running for our lives. Same thing was true with Camille, only she didn't run. She stopped and fought. She fuck up anyone who called her a nigga. Camille was about that action, bitch. One day, mom happened to be home when me and Roy came running in. She looked out the window and saw the white gang. She grabbed us both, opened the door, and told the boys who'd been chasing us, ain't no harm in fighting, long as you do a fair and square. Which one you two boys want to fight my sons? Two guys jumped out. Fine, said mom. Go at it. I know that's right. She's a fucking Baltimore. This is a hood. His mom is a hood bitch, okay? Maybe it was because mom was looking. Maybe her confidence filtered down into us. Whatever the reason, Roy and I had no problem kicking their asses. We beat them into bloody submission while mom beamed with pride. That didn't solve the problem, though. It wasn't just the greased-up Elvis Presley, James Dean-looking thugs at school who came after us. It was our neighbors as well. Like Boston, Buffalo is a black-hating racist city. Every week, someone would, look, would lob a rock through our front window or burn a cross in a little patch of grass in front of our apartment. Wow. Like, the level... Let's just pause here. The level of trauma that he experienced in a way that he was able to still be so imaginative in his visual and sonic presentation as the Rick James that we know him as is, is really quite remarkable. Every week someone would love that rock. We wanted to move back to the old projects and be with black people. We wanted to be with our own. We begged mom to get us out of there. No way, she said. We deserve to be here. It's all right. No one's going to drive us out of our house. We staying. Why, I kept asking. Because I worked damn hard for this place. And the law is on my side. Law says as long as we got the money, and we do, we can live damn well anywhere we please. Now, what's interesting is she worked for the Italian mafia running numbers. So she was good enough to run the numbers, but had a terrible time having a decent place to live with the same people she's running numbers with. Interesting. Our neighbors and schoolmates didn't see it that way. They thought we were invading their territory and they weren't going to have it. When Camille came out the corner grocery store holding big bags of food, a motorcycle gang was waiting for her. Their leader was a muscle head called Toby. He gave his boys the high sign and just like that, they started knocking over Camille and stomping on her food. There were too many of them for her to fight. When mom heard the story, she grabbed a long kitchen knife and headed down to the grocery store. The gang was still there. Touch one of my kids again, Mom told Toby, and I'll put this knife through your heart. I'll go after you and every one of you motherfuckers, and I won't be alone. The look on Mom's face and the tone of Mom's voice stopped the boys in their tracks. They knew it was best to keep their mouth shut. That night when I heard her call my older brother Carmen, I knew it was on. Carmen was fierce. he just got out, gotten out of prison for the third time. Oh, shit. She called Devo up this motherfucker. <laughs> I didn't know all the reasons he'd been sent to jail, but I assumed they involved violence. Carmen was a violent man. He was short, five foot seven or eight, but built of steel. His dark brown eyes looked right through you. When Roy and I were misbehaving beyond normal amounts, Mom would threaten to call Carmen. He was her enforcer. A beating from Mom was one thing. The core from her eye and hurt like hell. But a beating from Carmen was something else. He used his fist. When I asked mom the details of whether Carmen would go after Toby, I never got a straight answer. You go on and mind your business, son, said mom. That's something you don't need to worry about. Roy and I talked about it all the time. A few days passed and then a few weeks. Wonder when Carmen's getting here, said Roy. Wonder what's going to happen when he does show up, I said. We didn't have to wonder for long. One night, I was asleep in the bed, and I shared with Roy when I heard his commotion outside. Fuck you, nigga. Fuck you, you punk-ass motherfucker. I ran to the window. The streetlights had been shot out, and it was too dark to make sense of what was happening. Clearly, though, a blow-to-blow -blow struggle was underway. I started to run out and see for myself, but Mom was blocking the door. Get back in your room, she said. Carmen's taking care of this. Not many minutes later, I heard the door and saw Carmen walk in. He was with a prison mate friend and a third man who I hadn't seen in years. 
my father. The three of them had some bruises and bloody knuckles. You take care of business, mom asked Carmen. Carmen was quick to answer. Toby and them ain't never going to bother you again. And they never did. Word went out that the Johnson gang was the baddest in Buffalo. Toby and his boys were in the hospital for a month. And when they finally got out, they never said another word to us. Nigga was no longer in their vocabulary. I know that's the fuck right. Okay? Funny, though, that mom who hated the word nigga when white people used it against us used it herself when she punished me. If I got caught stealing and telling a lie, she put me over her knee, whip out that iron cord, and let me have it all the time saying, little nigga, you ain't never going to do that again, are you? No, man, my cry. Never, ever. With mom, with mom said nigga, N-I-G-G-A, even though she was about to whip me, she used it with love. When Toby said nigga, even though he was also looking to put a beating on me, he said it with hatred. Mom wanted to hurt me so I wouldn't be bad again. Toby wanted to kill me so I'd be dead. And it's a difference, bitch, okay? When Carmen took care of Toby, a good feeling washed all over me. I lived through Carmen just as I lived through mom. They were both tough characters who walked through the world without fear. They were both fighters, and they were my family. Carmen taught me and Roy how to box. We both proved to be fierce fighters. Carmen also taught us how to wield a switchblade. Don't matter how you win a fight, said Carmen, long as you win, bitch, and he ain't never motherfucking lied. Mom bought a 10-speed bike for me and Roy to share. Don't go off without the other, she said. Make sure you got each other's back. I ride while Roy walked or ran beside me, then vice versa. We had our game down tight. Then came the day when instead of sharing a bike with Roy, I decided to go bounce on, that, bounce on Nancy down in the basement. Roy didn't mind. He now, if you didn't catch the first part of reading, Nancy is the 14-year-old girl that been really molesting Rick James since he was 9 or 10. He had the 10 speed all to himself. When he didn't come home, though, we all started to worry. Where's your brother, asked mom. Out riding. Why you ain't riding with him? I was too tired, I lied. Then came the call from the hospital. An ice cream truck ran a red light and smashed head on to Roy, dragging him for blocks. Is my baby going to die? Mom asked the doctor when we all rushed to over to the hospital. It's going to be close. Our family huddled together in prayer. The prayer was answered. Roy was spared, but remained in the hospital for two months. For two years, he had to wear a cast that covered both of his legs up to his waist. Mom became his nurse. In spite of her day job cleaning houses and her night job running numbers, she found time to take care of, care of him. Whenever she wasn't working, she was with Roy. I felt like I had lost her. I also felt like she blamed me for the accident. Why hadn't I been there? If I had, maybe I would have pushed Roy out the way. Maybe I could have prevented the whole thing. Naturally, I never told my mom the truth that I was too busy fucking Nancy to worry about Roy. But I detected that mom had guessed the truth. She didn't come out and accuse me of anything, but I felt a strange vibe. I felt the distance between me and mom that was never there before. And rather than try to decrease that distance and move closer to her, I went the other way. I widened the gap. Rather than subject myself to what felt like mom's scorn, I avoided mom altogether. I got bitter. I thought back to those times when mom took me to the nightclubs and I played, I get to play drums during the breaks. I had a natural talent for percussion. Yes, he did, because if you ever heard of Rick James' record, the drums on that bitch ain't no more. The grown-up party people would gather around me and dance, applaud, and sing my praises. My boy's special, mom say. My boys got him some genius talent. After Roy's accident, though, mom didn't offer to take me to the clubs anymore. Those private nights between me and mom were over. Roy was the one who got all her private time. I tried to focus on school, but couldn't. The teachers kept telling me I was smart, but no one knew how to handle my reading problem. No one knew how to get me to pay attention to words on the page or numbers on the blackboard. I was good at all the sports. I was a scrappy YMCA boxer and got a reputation as a tough brawler, but I was never the best athlete. If I couldn't be the best, I'd rather play. My best friend became music. In music, I was easily the best. I could sing in a deep, rich voice, sounding older than I was. 
I could pick out harmony notes and give them to the other guys who like to sing doo-wop with me. I could pick up a guitar and just by instinct play a blues riff by B.B. King or a rhythm riff by Bo Diddley. When I came home to show mom what I had learned, she said, Later, son, I got to tend to Roy tonight. Well, I had my own affairs to tend to. I had turned 13 and had more than one girl. I put the lessons that Nancy taught me to good use. A lot of the older girls, ones who were seniors in high school, got the idea that I had special talents. One of the nastier girls, I'll call her Charlene. Now I'm starting to understand the Mary Jane girls, why it's starting to make sense. Had a body that wouldn't quit. She was known for giving up, giving it up easily and quickly. One day at school, she whispered in my ear, I hear you a pussy pleaser, is that right? Before I could answer yes, my dick was already hard. That night in the back seat of an abandoned car on the outskirts of the city, my dick was deep inside her. For a kid, she said, you know how to last long. I ain't no kid, I said, and to prove it, I went back for seconds, lasting even longer than the first time. When Charlene told her best friend, Brenda, about my prowess, Brenda made her wishes known to me. Brenda was an only child who lived alone with her mother, and her mother was gone for the weekend. Brenda liked it from behind. Didn't I know how to do it that way? This way, that way, I said, always in my ways. From then on, I call her Brackdoor Brenda. <laughs> Bitch. I got busy in a hurry. Pleasing girls was good work. Pleasing girls was a lot more satisfying than schoolwork. Even on those occasions when I made a good grade or wrote a report praised by my teacher, mom was too preoccupied with Roy to acknowledge me. So I found ways to get that acknowledgement from other females. One Friday night, I was with a girl who kept me busy till the wee hours in the morning. After our marathon, I fell asleep and didn't wake up till 10 a.m. I'd never been out all night before. I thought mom would kill me, but when I got home, mom was feeding Roy. She didn't bother to look up and say hello. She hadn't even noticed that I'd been out all night. That crushed me. That also got me to thinking that she didn't even care. And if that was the case, I could go on and do whatever the hell I wanted to. I could steal some money out of her purse and hop a Greyhound in New York City. Ain't nothing like a mother's love. Ain't nothing like a mother's love. Damn. That shit crazy. Backdoor Brenda, though. That shit is a key. Okay. The Greyhound was cheap. The ride was long. I was bored to death. With all the stops, it took from 10 in the morning to 10 at night for the bus to make its way from Buffalo to the New York City Port Authority Terminal on 42nd Street. I'd have been there a million times in my life. When I got out, the energy hit me hard. The lights were blazing. The city was alive. The city was screaming. I started walking faster than I usually walk. I started thinking faster than I usually think. I remember one of my girlfriends telling me that Greenwich Village was the spot for jazz. I asked the brother which way to Greenwich Village. He pointed to the subway. I bought a token and a half hour later was standing in front of the village vanguard. John Coltrane appearing tonight. Great. How do I get in? The line is long and the admission is high. All my time with mom had taught me how to slip into clubs without being noticed. I waited till there was a little discussion at the door between the ticket taker and the ticket holder. When the ticket taker was distracted, I slipped under the rope and stood by the kitchen door. There were a few empty seats. I chose one back in the dark shadows. It was a small club, so it didn't matter where I sat. I was in. I was 400 miles away from home. I was about to hear John Coltrane tell the good news. I heard Coltrane back in Buffalo when he was still with Miles, but this was the newly liberated Coltrane. Coltrane the leader. The Coltrane of giant steps. And my favorite things, Giant Steps that has Naima on it, I believe, which is one of my favorite records that he's ever done. The Cold Train that all the hip cats in Buffalo had been listening to night and day. Among them all, I'd be the first to say, I've seen the Cold Train live and in person at the Village Vanguard. I was in a privileged position, and I damn well knew it. I remember the name of every man on that stage. I studied each musician like a jeweler studies a watch. McCoy Tyner was the pianist. Reggie Workman played the upright bass. Eric Dolphy blew the bass clarinet and an instrument I had never even seen before. Elvin Jones changed forever the way I viewed the drums. He gave the drums a voice, 
like the drum was a trumpet or a saxophone. All these men were masters who understood they were there to serve their master, John Coltrane. Train switched back and forth from soprano to tenor sax. On his soprano, his voice was high and crying. On tenor, his voice was manly and moaning. He didn't say a word to the audience except to introduce the song. This is spiritual, was all he said. He did all the explaining with his instrument. It wasn't a regular song that lasted three to four minutes. It seemed to last 30. Trains seemed to go on a journey, like the journey I took from Buffalo to Greenwich Village. He kept on riding, kept on looking out the window, kept on describing everything he saw, except the window was a window into his own mind. I felt like he was opening up his mind for me to see inside, and his mind was filled with ideas. One idea led to another. The gears were in motion and meshed together. I understood how his mind was working, because mind worked the same way. It was a spirit that was moving him. That's why the song was called Spiritual. That spirit was moving me. That spirit had finally let me focus on something for a long time without getting restless or bored. I could see where I could ride that spirit all the way to the end of the line. Woo! Child. Child, child, child. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting because Rick James is a musician. And it is so funny how the show business aspect, the show of it all matters the most because reading about his music knowledge and how much music knowledge he possesses and the people that he saw, this wasn't a gimmicky musician. You understand what I'm saying? This is a man who's truly studied and and really knew the fundamentals and, uh, and valued the fundamentals of music, which I think is amazing. And it speaks to his, his legend. The line called the A-Train led me to Harlem and the Apollo Theater, which had haunted my imagination ever since mom started bringing home jet magazines with pictures of the stars posed in front of his big marquee on 125th Street. When the coal train set ended, I ran up to catch the last show at the Apollo. The big star was Jackie fucking Wilson. Okay, for those of you who know music, he's literally in one night saw a John Coltrane in Greenwich Village, caught the A-Train, which the A-Train does run to Harlem. If you're familiar with New York, it'll take you from Greenwich all the way up to Harlem. It's one one train that's all you got to catch. So he goes from seeing John Coltrane to Jackie Wilson in one fucking night. Okay? If Train was heaven in the sky, Jackie was heaven on earth. He was down to earth, down to where women got wet just watching him move his hips and do his splits. Jackie Wilson made Elvis look like Howdy Doody. The Jackie Wilson I saw that night at the Apollo was prime Jackie Wilson. Lonely teardrops and to be loved Jackie Wilson. Lonely teardrops, which fun fact, lonely teardrops was written by Barry Gordy, the founder of Motown. Bitch, okay. Um, the Jackie Wilson of talk that talk and dogging around. The Jackie Wilson who was at, who asked the audience, am I the man? Had a sister screaming, yes, daddy. Hell yes. You all the man I need. During my trip to the Vanguard in the Apollo, I had me an epiphany. Brother, I had me a vision. I wanted John Coltrane's sacred spirit and Jackie Wilson's sexual energy. So he's getting, he's getting, pause, he's getting his music theory and his structure from Coltrane. He's getting the, the, the beginning pieces of his showmanship and performance from Jackie fucking Wilson. I don't understand. Like, I don't think you understand how major this is and how much insight it gives you into what you ended up finally seeing from Rick James in his prime. It's, it's amazing. I wanted Train's imagination and Jackie's syncop syncopation. I wanted to be honored like Train is a great artist and be worshipped like Jackie is a great lover. I wanted it all. What you going to get, said Mom, when I got I came back to Buffalo later the next day? Is it a whooping like you? If it's a whooping like you've never got before, the whipping was serious, but but the trip was worth it. I had been in the presence of genius. The standards had been set. Now I was on the move. 
Every few weeks, I scrounge up some money to hop the bus back to New York. I needed to hear Art Blakey, Blakely and the Jazz Messengers do moaning at the Birdland and see Chubby Checker doing the twist at the Peppermint Lounge. The pattern set in. I'd come home, get a beating from mom, then go back again. Finally, she had enough. She sent the cops after me. They found me hiding in a tiny bathroom in the back of the Buffalo Greyhound Station and hauled me off to a juvenile delinquent home. Mom came to visit. Why, was the first thing she asked. Why are you always running, son? I don't know, I said. I get antsy. I need to get out and see the world. There's music I need to hear. There's music in Buffalo. Not like New York. But your family's in Buffalo. Your family's all you got. You know that, don't you? Yes, I do. And you know I love you. I know that too, Mom. Then stop all this nonsense before something real bad happens. I stayed quiet. Did you hear me, James? I heard you, Mom. And you'll listen to me. I will. I didn't. I got into deeper devilment. I started running with one of the gangs at school. I did that because the danger excited me. I did that to show the tough guys that I wasn't scared of nothing. It was all about action and music. I didn't have an instrument to play, so I took Mom's broom and strummed it like a guitar until all the straw fell out on the kitchen floor. When Mom saw what I had done, she broke out the iron cord, another weapon. I took that anger and put it into a gang fight. In one of those rumbles, a kid got shot. I wasn't the shooter, but along with three others, I was arrested and spent three months back in the juvie. Now, here's where I want to pause. Here's where I want to pause. Because in this last exchange with him and his mom and him going into New York, and it was a different time when, when, when this was going on with him in black America in a different time in how you disciplined your children. But this is... A great example of what happens when you don't communicate with your children. And I'm not a parent, but I've been a rebellious child. I've been the prodigal son. And I could honestly say that he probably would have done better or maybe not have gone certain ro down certain roads had they just been able to have the conversation. Because we're reading these things and we're like, wow, you know. But to a parent, she's not, she's scared. And she's the mother of, what, eight children? Working, running numbers, cleaning houses. So the time for a child, when you have a creative child, an artistic child, that child requires a certain type of parenting and a certain type of attention. And when you can't get that, a lot of those type of children either become troubled children or troubled problem children or they become distant and, and lethargic. Um, which is interesting to me. So it, it's interesting. I think this is a great lesson in parenting and, and how important it is to talk to your kids and understand where, where they're coming from, especially if you were raised in a certain time in black America or just in black America in general we are typically raised up until like this new century, I want to say, you were raised to be seen and not heard. But if you can't, if the child can't be heard and they're not talking, you don't know what's going on. You're only going to see what you want to see or see what they show you, which is either going to be a really well-behaved child or a rebel. Now, when I got out, Mom was so furious, she went for the iron cord again. But by then, I was too old for a beating and far stronger than her. I caught her hand and held it. This look of bewilderment came over her eyes. Then came the tears. I couldn't stand seeing Mom cry. But tears or no tears, that woman wasn't going to beat me again. The mood of our household, reflecting the mood of my mother, went from low to high in a New York minute. Guess what, baby? She said one Sunday when she and her boyfriend, Al Glenn, came out of her bedroom. What? Me and Al are getting married. Ain't that wonderful? I didn't know what to say. I felt like I was losing my mother to another man. At the same time, I've been noticing that the more she was with Al back there in her bedroom, the less angry she was with me. Al helped her moves. Al, Al also got her pregnant and got me a little baby sister, Penny. Penny brought joy to the family. She was everybody's baby doll. And Al bought us our first real house with a real front and backyard. It was on Ferry Street in a better, block, uh, better black hood than what we were used to. The 
The only drawback was that Al's mama, daddy, brother, and sister lived on the second floor. Each of them weighed at least 300 pounds. It was like living under elephants. Every time they took a step, the ceiling shook like it was about to cave in. They were also holy roller Christians who looked down at us sinners. Mom's marriage was working out, except for his heavy drinking. Al was a cool guy, but the living arrangement was all wrong. I was still looking to escape. Other than my gang exploits, my big escape was music. At Bennett High, I was a decent jock, but I could never compete with someone like Bob Lanier, the star of our basketball team, who go on to NBA glory with the Detroit Pistons. This motherfucker is like Forrest Gump, okay? In music, though, I figured I could compete with anyone, even the great John Coltrane. I just needed a sax of my own. But Mr. Hilliard, our music teacher, said all the saxes were taken. So, and it's interesting because, pause, when you listen to, like, a lot of the Rick James songs, they have really great horn sections. When you listen to the Mary Jane, record, Mary Jane Girl records and some of the Tina Marie records, you hear really great saxophone solos. So, I went to a set of drums and started banging away. I must have been playing for 10 minutes before Mr. Hilliard came over and said, Not bad, James. Where'd you learn to play? Taught myself. Let me hear what you do. Hear you do a double paradiddle. A double what? It's an essential drum rudiment. You have to learn the rudiments. Why? I can already knock out a killer groove. Strong rhythm is essential, but it isn't everything. Well, I want to know everything. Then stick around. I tried, but couldn't stick around for long. Mr. Hilliard, a Juilliard graduate, had a lot of information that went over my head. Even the words he used, like polyrhythms and complex time signature, got my head to swimming. I didn't have the patience to learn out of a book. I didn't want to spend my time exercising the muscles in my fingers. I just wanted to groove. Mr. Hilliard and I went back and forth. He said the groove wasn't enough. I said the groove was the magic. That's why I trained to keep riffing for a half hour on the same song. Elvin Jones' groove locked him in. Same thing with James Brown. His grooves were monsters. I was also deep into the Latin grooves of Mongo, Santa Maria, and Willie Bobo. The mid-60s, my teen years, was the time that Motown, just across Lake Erie from Buffalo, was grooving like a motherfucker. Those huge hits by the Supremes, the Four Tops, the Temptations, the Miracles, Martha and the Vandellas, and Marvin Gaye came out of the great grooves of a rhythm section that I later learned was anchored by bassist James Jamerson and drummer Benny Benjamin, cats called the Funk Brothers. I knew I was a natural-born Funk Brother and didn't need no book to prove it. Mr. Hilliard was a good guy who put up with my arrogance as best he could. Hard as he tried, though, he couldn't get me to study. I might have eventually listened to him were it not for a decision I made during my sophomore year at Bennett. I entered the talent contest. I was nervous as hell, so scared that the night of the show I had to run to the bathroom and throw up. But I was also confident enough to face an auditorium filled with all my teachers, friends, and family. The world was watching me. My plan was to kill the crowd by keeping it simple. I went on stage with nothing but a drum and a couple of sticks. I set a funk beat and stayed on it long time before opening my mouth. The groove accented by the rim shots got the crowd going. Every crowd loves a groove. I decided to sing the song everyone knew, Stevie Wonder's Fingertips. That number has a bongo beat of its own, but I added to that beat. I put my own hurting on it and gave it a new edge. Fingertips is a sing-along type song making it easy for me to get the crowd going. It was easy for them to get on their feet and shouting. It was easy to get them up dancing in the aisles. Easy to get them to make me sing the song a second and third time. Took the principal 10 minutes to calm them down. I walked off with first prize, and musically speaking, no one could tell me shit. Sorry, Mr. Hellyer, you're a cool guy, but I won't be needing those books of yours. I can make the world dance without them. Come to find out that singing on stage made the girls love me more. After my victory, they were coming after me like moths to a flame. Beautiful butterflies were fluttering around me. From the minute I became a little jive-ass star in high school, it was never enough to have one. Sure, I liked the blue butterfly, but the yellow one was cool and the orange one was even cooler. They were all so pretty that I had to have me a collection. And naturally, the cats I ran with had to know about my collection. In their eyes... That made me a bigger man. The bigger my collection, the more time I spent studying their beauty. I skipped a lot of school until Bennett kicked me out. 
Welcome to East High, notorious for its juvenile delinquents. I fit right in until I got kicked out. While I was there, though, I took on another challenge. East High had an all-black marching band called the Brown Cadet Corps with riflemen, bugle blowers, and long-legged majorettes. I wanted to see whether I could cut it as a drummer in the corps. I also wanted to wear the super sharp uniforms. This unit was cleaner than the Board of Health, as well as to score some of that juicy majorette pussy. Proud to report that I accomplished both my goals. Marching around the football fields of Western New York, I ain't drop a beat. And diving into those major rats, I got me the honey I've been dreaming of. East High let me go. My lousy grades, poor attendance, and disrespectful manners with the teachers, who I saw as stuffed shirts and old maids, were too much. I was too bad for even a bad school girl. Grover Cleveland was my third and last stop high school. It was a mix of Italian and chocolate, and the tension was high. They called us niggas, and we called them guineas. It wasn't exactly a level playing field because a couple of the guineas had fathers in the mob. That meant our fighting equipment, mainly switchblades and baseball bats stolen from the gym, didn't have a chance against the serious handguns holstered under their leather jackets. When mom caught wind of the coming wars between the black and Italian gangs, she pulled me out of that school before I could quit. She may have saved my life. Two weeks after I was gone, there was a nasty rumble where one of my partners got shot in the heart. My school history came to a screeching halt. I told myself that I'd never see the insides of a classroom again, and I was glad. But I was also without a clue. No school, no job, no future. 16-year-old black boy running the snowy streets of Buffalo looking to break out. But what does he make of the world around him? Barry Goldwater is running for president against Lyndon Johnson. The Vietnam War is firing up, and the draft is on. Civil rights legislation is being passed, and Martin Luther King is in the news. But the hippocats on the corner are talking about Malcolm X. Where do I go? What do I do? How in the hell am I ever going to get over? And that is our, our two chapters for the night. So let's unpack this. Um, I think these were a two good chapters. Two good chapters. Um, it's a classic story. It's a classic story of... Um, what happens when we lose our boys? Um, what happens when we don't nurture them? And honestly, the teacher, Mr. Hilliard, the band teacher who went to Juilliard, by the time he got to Rick, it was already too late. Um, the formative things, the formative years, those middle school years, and they, they talk, if you ever seen season four of The Wire, they say this and it's so true. There's a sweet spot that you have to reach children at. And um, you have to get them, especially if they are, they are at what I, what I would say at-risk children, you have to get them by a certain time. Because if you don't capture them and steer them and mold them by a certain time, it's over. They didn't have to make the choice of where they go in life. And some do redeem themselves and bounce back, but some don't. Um, so it's a limited window. I think what is so interesting is that he clearly had a passion. Music was his passion. But it wasn't... I think mom dropped the ball, but I'm not upset with mom. Because mom had a lot on her plate. Um, and my thing is, if dad could come back to fight, dad could come back to raise, help raise his child. Um, somebody said, how many chapters in the book? It's quite a few, but this is such a quick read. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to skip some chapters um, and get to certain parts. But um, I think the beginning life, the beginning of his life is so important. And it's also a testament to him and who he is, because here's the thing. And a lot of times, and, and I can relate to this so heavy, because like I said, I'm not a famous person, but for someone who has studied music for many years and started getting a following, a bigger following, reading books like these and discussing politics and things like that, um, there are so many things that you discuss, so many things that you study and learn that make you who you are in the end 
And artists draw from a myriad of inspirations. And in reading this book and being very familiar with Rick James's catalog, everything, he really took everything in his life and attributed it to his artistry. Being a marching band, major reps, when you see some of those outfits, the leotards with the boots, that's all, like, everything about it is 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 interesting. And I can't wait to get to the chapter where he um, talks about what inspired his hair, that signature braided um, braided cut with the bob, with the, with the bang. Because when you hear what inspired that cut, it's amazing. Nothing, what I love about reading this book and studying Rick James, the artist and the human being, is that everything was intentional. Um, sure, there were some happy accidents, but he's a very studied person. And I think that that's so, um, so important to learn. I think that we don't respect artists and people enough for their for being a student because he is very much being a student now albeit in a different way no he's not the kid that's going to sit and be able to read music and you know like how the Juilliard kid they, like some people do really well in art school or in music college and things like that that's not necessarily the way that everyone learns um, it's just like when I read these books or I, we talk about politics and things like that. I have college students who say, you know, you made me help, help me get through this semester because you were able to relate it to me in a way where I could digest it and then write this book report or do this research paper. Um, and I think that that's, that's so important. But with that being said, it is the weekend. Uh, I do have weekend things to do. I'm going to finish my beverage. Oh, that's nice and cold. Um, and you guys have a good weekend if you're watching this on YouTube. Don't forget to hit the bell for notifications. Make sure you follow me on social media, all media outlets at Dapper Dan Midas, or visit me on my website, www.dapperdanmidas.com. Um, the Ballad of Omar EP is coming out next month. I'm so excited. We got two visuals for that that I think you're really going to like. And it's also going to give you some insight on my background. I know a lot of you who watch these broadcasts know me from the readings and the comedy and, you know, all of that. But um, the reason why I picked this book is because he's a serious musician and I very much am one as well. Um, and I think by reading this book, it's helping me understand who I am. And I think it will help you understand who I am. Um, but with that being said, you guys have a great evening. Enjoy your weekend. Stay safe. Uh, make the best decisions for your life and your family. And y'all be blessed. Good night.